Good afternoon. Uh, bon après-midi. My name is Jean Lebel. I am the president of IDRC, donc je suis le président du CRDI. C'est un plaisir de vous souhaiter la bienvenue à un autre euh, événement, une conférence avec euh, le docteur, le docteur, le docteur, le docteur Fraser Taylor. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you. Uh, some familiar faces, some new faces. Welcome to IDRC, the International Development Research Center. Uh, as many of you know, we are conducting from time to time these uh, little conference with visitors to town or people that are in town but have something to bring in the global picture of research for global development. Um, today, Dr. Uh, Fraser Taylor, our estimated guest, uh, will be talking about you know, cyber cartography broadly. The name of the presentation is on the screen at each end. I won't repeat it. But I'm going to give a little bit of information on Dr. Taylor and certainly uh, a, a bit of IDRC history with it. Because uh, I came to know Dr. Taylor at the uh, ceremony uh, related to the Killian Price Award at Ridol last June. The Killian Price are uh, some of the most prestigious prizes for science in Canada. They were established in 1981 from a donation and endowment from the uh, Killian family. And they cover health science, natural sciences, social sciences, and the humanities. And this year, Dr. Fraser Taylor received the one on social sciences. It's highly prestigious. And every year, I'm trying to bring to the center one of those prize recipients. Last year, we had Lauren Babiak, who was the health sciences uh, recipient. Et pourquoi uh, j'ai invité le Dr. Taylor cette année avec uh, l'équipe du CRD? C'est que au moment de la remise des prix à Rideau Hall, on s'est brièvement parlé et le docteur Taylor m'a fait part de sa longue relation avec uh, le CRD. In fact, he pointed to me that he was involved with IDRC even before the creation of IDRC. So, with the good help of our communication services and our excellent archives, someone was able to retrieve the testimony of young Dr. Fraser at that time adjunct professor at Carleton University in a testimony that he gave to the International Affair and National Defense Standing Committee of the House. It was in February 1970, and it was at the time they were debating the creation of the International Development Research Center. And as a witness, he has sat there, he sat there, and he gave something that you can go on record. I gave him a copy today of his uh, testimony. And he said a couple of things that I think are quite visionary. First, he mentioned to the committee that um, IDRC should be responding to the demand of the researcher in the developing region, that this was not the monopoly of Canadian researcher, but in order to have a functioning center, it should be demand-driven, and it should not only be Canadian, but it should be, you know, particularly at that time, African researcher, given the experience he had in Kenya. The second thing he said was, um, we should have interdisciplinary research because the problem that we're facing are quite complex, 1970. Then we should invest in youth because it's not only the old researcher that are making science progress. It's often young researcher, and if we don't support young researcher, you know, where are we going to be heading with innovation that will help to resolve the problem in the developing region? Another element was IDRC should be localized in Ottawa because of the diplomatic presence international agency. And the last thing he said was IDRC should be separated from the uh, from CEDA, the Canadian International Development Agency. Now, was he visionary? I think so, because everything that he said that time in 1970 in support of the creation of IDRC still remained true today and is uh, largely a driving force or are driving forces of uh, our presence here in Ottawa. Uh, so that's 
the connection to our early days at IDRC. But following this, he has been a distinguished research professor at Carleton. He is the director of the Geomatic and Cartographic Research Center. Uh, he is one of the leading cartographers and a pioneer in the introduction of use of computer and cartography. He was one of the first, if not the first, researcher to ever publish a digital atlas, 1970. In 1997, he introduced and coined the term cyber cartography, a set of tools and techniques that are made in order to get better information, illustrate it, and lead to better decision in all kind of contexts, and he will talk of this uh, in his uh, presentation. And Dr. Taylor was in the early days, he's coming back today, but in between, we were also supporting some of his work, namely in Kenya, where uh, he worked on rural development. On a global level, he's engaged in numbers of area, including with the United Nations Initiative on Geospatial Information Management, and I think recently he was at a meeting in Mexico on this, related to land tenure. And he brings to us today, you know, perspective of his long experience, where initially I thought he was a geographer. No, he was a rural development specialist. That was his area of knowledge when he started. He brought it with cartography and merged them together in order to bring to us, you know, some of the best mind in the world in the topics of cartography, a tool that is ancient but so much modern these days and used in all kinds of places and circumstances. So without further ado, I will invite Dr. Fraser Taylor to address the audience, and afterwards we will be in a question period with Stephen Meggert, the Vice President Program of IDRC, and Dr. Taylor, and then with the audience. We are also welcoming guests and students, probably, uh, from around the world or Canada to this speech. Welcome to you all, and please send also your question through our website. Alors, c'est un plaisir de vous accueillir. Le Dr. Taylor va se faire une présentation d'une trentaine de minutes. Par la suite, Stephen Megger, notre vice-président au programme, interagira avec le Dr. Taylor. Et puis, l'auditoire, vous, ainsi que ceux sur le web pourront poser vos questions au Dr. Taylor et bénéficieront ainsi de la connaissance de notre invité de prestige. Dr. Fraser Taylor, welcome to IDRC. The podium is yours. And this is Pauline Dole for our communication group. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Lebel. C'est un grand plaisir d'être ici encore une fois. Young researchers, such as myself, 50 odd years ago, came up with some ideas, and uh, I'm extremely pleased to see the way which IDRC has developed. It has made a very important contribution and continues to make an important contribution to development worldwide, and I think. Canadians should be very proud of the achievements of IDRC. Today, I'm going to talk about global geo information management and sustainable development, some observations. Hmm. If I had to sum up in one paragraph or one sentence, what my research has been about over the years, it would be the first paragraph on that slide. The application of geospatial information processing to the analysis of topics of interest to society, including, of course, development-related issues, and the display of the results in ways that people can easily understand. I've learned from experience that it's a bad idea not to start with some light conversation 
on a heavy lecture. And one of the problems with the geospatial field, as with many fields, is it has its own jargon. And the jargon can be totally incomprehensible sometimes. My favorite joke in this respect is what do you get when you cross a geospatial information specialist with a mafia don? And the answer is an offer you do not understand. <laughs> So I'm tempting to keep the jargon to a minimum. But although that paragraph is short, it sums up a whole number of very interesting applications. Now clearly location has always been central to the understanding of socioeconomic issues in all countries and continues to be. The United Kingdom, for example, has a new locational strategy, and it begins by saying, everything happens somewhere. And although that seems like a facile remark, it has remarkable depth. Location is of key importance to understanding society. It is key importance in development issues, and it needs to be given a greater degree of attention than it has been given so far. Look, the importance of location to everyday life is increasing exponentially. As we tend to be a materialistic society, I'm going to begin by giving you some figures relating to the economics of geospatial information. There have been two recent studies by Google, or commissioned by Google, <coughs> putting the US geospatial services industry on the map uh, from 2012, and what is the economic impact of geoservices? Here's just a quick summary of the economic importance of location-based information in the United States. The main findings of the U.S. study shows that the impact of the geospatial services industry, that is, organizations and services that use location to provide you with a service is 15 to 20 times that of the traditional geospatial industry. The geospatial industry, for example, in 2011, <clears throat> $73 billion in, US, in the U.S. and half a million high-wage jobs, whereas the geospatial services industry was $1.6 trillion in revenues and is used on a daily basis by over 5 million workers, which is over 4% of the U.S. workforce. In addition, <coughs> U.S. consumers place the direct value on geospatial services of $37 billion annually. Geo-applications and location-enabled devices are central to daily life. At the global level, the estimates are 150 to 270 billion revenue generated annually, with 113 billion value added, 0.2% uh, of the global gross domestic product. And it's growing very rapidly at over 30% per year. So these figures are indicative of how important this is in economic terms, and of course, the importance is not only economically. At the original Earth Summit in Rio in 1992 and the subsequent Rio Plus 10 Summit, the need for the integration of many different types of information on sustainable development issues <coughs> into a common framework was clearly recognized. This came up again at the recent meetings in, um, um, in Rio. I'm arguing that all of the issues impacting sustainable development can be addressed using location as a key, making the location-based organization of information so important to effective policymaking possible. And this can provide a powerful common framework 
which has been so much called for and so much lacking in our work. There are huge amounts of information out there, and what is missing is an organizational framework to draw them together more effectively so that they can be used. There is duplication. People reinvent the wheel not just uh, every year but almost daily because they fail to understand that others are doing similar things to them, and we need to change that. I had the occasion to meet with Prime Minister Kim Won sik in 2011, and there is his statement that geospatial information is the most fundamental tool to support the planet's joint efforts in resolving global issues. By interconnecting information on natural disasters, poverty, and the environment through location data, global issues such as sustainable development and poverty eradication can be effectively, more effectively managed. Why have we not moved in that direction if it's so obvious that it's powerful? There have been both institutional and technical constraints which has limited the application of location-based information. And in the last decade, in particular, the situation has changed. <clears throat> Geospatially enabled information technology structures now exist to meet the requirements for decision support, policy discussions, and modeling required by the, the sustainable development community. One of the key organizational structures is the spatial data infrastructure. These are infrastructures based on location, which allow the interoperability of information on a wide variety of topics. And that is the definition of a spatial data infrastructure used by the US Office of Management and Budget. Such infrastructures already exist at a variety of scale, but are most commonly being created at the national level for example, the Malaysian Spatial Data Infrastructure, the Canadian Geospatial Data Infrastructure are two examples, but many, many countries are now developing these organizational mechanisms to link their information by location for national purposes. There are two major elements in the creation and use, the technical and the institutional. The technical elements are now widely available including the important development of standards and specification to allow the effective sharing of information and linkage of data sets. The technical term for this is interoperability. As with many things, the institutional issues are much more problematic, and this, of course, is the case with all international development problems. Regardless of the nature of the issue, or the scale at which it is being considered. For example, what I call human interoperability is a major problem. People will simply not work together and share information in an effective manner. For example, Hurricane Katrina in the United States some years ago, they had all the geospatial information they needed to work, but the various agencies would not or could not work together. In sharing data, in linking data sets, you have to have a willingness to share. If that willingness to share is not there, then no effective interaction takes place. In Canada, we face the problem of data silos each federal government agency has its own mandate. Nobody seems to have the mandate to cross the borders of each federal agency and to bring this information together. I'm pleased to say that in Canada, there has been a recent movement to change this, and 21 federal agencies are now cooperating together at the assistant deputy minister level in order to bring information together. But Canada, in some ways, is unusual, because in many countries, various agencies hug their data to their chest and refuse to release it, 
while at the same time indicating, yes, we are very prepared to share data in principle. When it comes down to reality, the ability to share because of the human constraints is really there. Legal interoperability. Remote sensing data is absolutely vital, for example, in the case of national disasters. But very often, the use of that remote sensing data is limited by licensing between the public and the private sector. As a result, even UN agencies have often got to purchase information in order to get around the problem of the legal barriers of sharing information. And there are many, many problems on legal interoperability, including issues like privacy, confidentiality, and a number of the other issues involved. So both human interoperability and legal interoperability are major difficulties in achieving what we would like to achieve with location as a key. Leadership at the UN level is now playing an important role in this respect. The United Nations Committee on Experts on Geospatial Information Management was established by ECOSOC in 2011. The first high-level forum of geospatial information management took place in Korea in November of 2011. There has been high-level government rec uh, recognition of this, and at that particular meeting, the Prime Minister of Korea and Cabinet Ministers from eight nations attended, and I had the pleasure of um, being involved in a private luncheon. And very quickly, the political decision makers saw the value of the use of location for a whole number of issues relating to national development and international development. And we have models for geospatial data at the national, regional, and global level now. But there are many weaknesses which we have to overcome. The semantics and the jargon, I already referred to that in my opening joke. We cannot even agree on the proper term. Is it location-based data? Is it geographical data? Is it geospatial data? What is it? And everybody has their own term, and there's no commonality. The approaches that have been taken are basically supply-driven. The national mapping agencies of the world are used to providing base coverage for everything, and they're transferring this old wine into the new technical bottles. Instead of looking at demand-driven approaches, what is the problem? What information do we need to address that problem? Rather than, let's provide the information and hope that it fits the needs. I can remember an early slide when the uh, internet was in its, uh, in its infancy of two spiders, and the cartoon is they built a web. And the question is, we built a web, now what? In essence, you are supplying as opposed to responding to demand. In many issues, they're not being driven by needs, and we're scratching where people do not itch. This is a human problem and a conceptual problem, not a technical problem. <clears throat> Another weakness. We need to integrate statistical and geospatial information. Harmonizing <clears throat> national statistical geospatial system and geospatial systems is a valuable means of integrating socioeconomic, environmental, and other data vital in understanding sustainable development. We also need to have a conceptual shift in managing geospatial information. Right now, many countries are managing their geospatial information, but we need to change that to the management of all information geospatially using location as a key. <clears throat> now, that is a very important conceptual and intellectual shift if we're going to take full advantage of location. One country which is doing this extremely well now is Korea. 
and I would argue that Korea is probably ahead of the rest of the world in this approach where you have government, academia and industry all working together using location as a key element. This is relatively recent and came out of the meeting that I spoke about in 2011. Open government, an increasingly important topic <coughs> nationally and internationally. Interoperability of data sets is absolutely vital if you're going to have open government. And without good standards and specifications to do this, I would argue that open government, effective open government, is impossible. If you do not have the means to share effectively, providing the willingness is there, then you cannot bring together the information in such a way that it's useful for open government. And in this respect, the geospatial field is far ahead in the development of the standards and specifications required to bring about effective interoperability. Some recent developments. We had a UN meeting in August this year in New York. <coughs> Some of the achievements. The establishment of a geodetic reference frame which underpins all location-based information. Until recently, we've had no common agreement on such a framework. Now we have, and it's going forward as a resolution to the UN General Assembly. We had a meeting in New York of the head of the world's statistical agencies with the head of the world's geospatial agencies to look at the integration of geospatial, statistical, and other information. We're developing legal policy frameworks to deal with the problem of legal interoperability. We have a new standards document in terms of the standards required to share information. <coughs> and we have new <coughs> regional groupings, Africa, Asia Pacific, Latin America and the Caribbean, Arab states, all with the same agenda and purposes. Uh, last week, I was in Mexico City at the meeting of the um, Latin American Caribbean group. And uh, the government of Mexico has just invested about four or five million dollars <coughs> to bring all of the Caribbean states together <coughs> to look at issues of climate change and disaster mitigation. Mexico has decided that it is a Caribbean country and is taking an important leadership role. And this is an important step uh, uh, forward. What about the future? We have to convince policymakers and analysts of the value of a location-based approach. <coughs> In development planning, macroeconomics plays a very large role, but macroeconomics is largely aspatial. And you have to convince the economists that a location approach is equally, if not more important, than macroeconomic modeling. We need to look at applications of our work <coughs> at the subnational scale, <coughs> especially, excuse me, to, <coughs> to local development. <coughs> we need to involve the public <coughs> in a bottom-up effort to generate information and empower them to generate their own development geo-narratives. It's about telling stories from a local perspective and getting those perceptions as part of the integral development studies process. We need to prevent, present different perspectives on socioeconomic issues. Uh, Dr. Lebel mentioned um, our concept of cyber cartography. One of the things we argue <coughs> is that in many issues, there is no one right answer and no one wrong answer, even in issues like climate change and environment. For example, there's a viewpoint of the hard scientist. There is a viewpoint of the politician. There is a viewpoint of the bureaucrat. And there are the viewpoints of local people. All of these are looking at the same set of facts 
but from very different perspectives. Now what we do in cyber cartography is we do not privilege one view over the other. We present all five or six views on the same topic expressed as the locals would express it if they uh, want or express as the scientists would express it. Thus allowing the individuals to look at our atlases, and the word atlas is really a metaphor for all kinds of qualitative and quantitative information linked by location, and get a much better idea of the complexity of many of these issues, and get away from the idea that we can solve this by this is right and that is wrong. There are very few things, certainly in the developed world, where you can say this is right and this is wrong. You need to understand these varying perspectives. We also need new forms of communication of information, multimedia and multisensory, which actively engage the user. Cyber cartography is multimedia and it's multisensory. I first developed these ideas when I was working with the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. We were out in the Gatineau on a field trip, and it was a beautiful spring day. And I said to the gentleman I was with, um, it's a beautiful day today, he said, yes, I can sense it. Why don't you add smell and other senses to your um, um, sound and touch and visualization processes? So I've been trying to use all five senses in presenting information to a limited uh, uh, success. Um, for smell, we use an instrument called an electronic nose, which breaks down any smell into its component parts, distributes these online, and then recombines them and puffs them out into your face, just as your inkjet printer would. The big problem has been that the companies who make the scent dispensers keep going broke because the market's not big enough, so we can't get the kind of technology we need. Taste is more difficult. We have an electronic tongue, but taste is a more complex thing. Um, I am a malt whiskey drinker, and my vision is to have an electronic tongue which can recreate malt whiskey, which I can pour out of my computer at any time I feel like it, and save the money I use at the Liquor Commission. <laughs> We need to link both qualitative and quantitative data sets. Too often we want hard measurements on everything and we can't effectively compare these with the softer qualitative data, so-called softer. What we do using location as a key in our cyber cartographic atlases is bring those two things together using location as the key variable it's surprising how much you can combine between qualitative and quantitative if you use this approach. If you want further information on some of the work we're doing, here are two or three um, sources for you. On cyber cartography, that is our website, and you can look at it any time. By the way, we are an open source. We do not charge for our software or for any of the information that we have. We believe that if public money is used in developing research, then that research should be widely available freely to the Canadian and other publics. There's a very interesting um, recent study on open data in developing countries, which I can recommend to you. And then there's the article, the, the paper that uh, we wrote for the uh, Rio Plus 20 conference on the contribution of geospatial information to the Rio Plus 20 processes, which is on the ggimun.org website. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention, and I hope I've given you some food for thought. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Taylor. Uh, really a uh, wide-ranging exploration of the value of science and uh, of science to meet the challenges of, uh, of today. Uh, 
of development, uh, of change. I wonder if we could uh, start by uh, asking you to talk uh, a bit about how you got started in uh, looking at these issues of uh, rural development and, and why maps seem to be uh, a way to both pull together information, present information, and communicate ideas. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, some long time ago, uh, I started my PhD thesis in Kenya, working on rural development in an isolated rural area. It was um, the best of times and the worst of times. The best of time was there was absolutely nothing written on the district. Uh, the worst of times was there was absolutely nothing written on the district. Yeah. So you could start from scratch. But I was collecting all kinds of different types of information. And I was, as originally trained uh, um, to use maps, I was using the old idea of putting a plastic overlay on top of the map, and then another plastic overlay on top of that. But after two or three, you couldn't see a damn thing. <laughs> oh, you could see the a, top plastic the overlay. Top was up. So at that time, Harvard University was developing a new form of um, computer-aided mapping which took information, uh, variables, by uh, pixel and stacked them up on top of each other. So I started using that in order to combine all the types of information I was getting to identify areas of the district which needed further exploration because <coughs> spatial correlation doesn't deal with causality, but it points to those areas where you need to seek a greater degree of causality. So at the same time as I was developing a career in rural development, I was developing a career in the new techniques of computer-assisted cartography. And I uh, produced the first computer atlas of Kenya in 1970, and the computer atlases of Ottawa Hull in 69 and 70, based on the technique. So I'm known for both. But these days, more for the work we're doing on the uh, cyber cartography side <coughs> than on the development side. Well, I'm going like, to keep you on the development side for a bit. First, do you still remember um, what the maps told you about oh, yes. rural development? Yeah, I certainly do. For example, um, I was very interested at that time in the growth center hypothesis, mm -hmm. the idea that if you invest in small urban centers, that the growth would spread out from those centers into the surrounding rural areas. So I took the information I had on income levels uh, from the town, visualized that in three dimensions in the computer, and found out that if the growth center theory was correct, it should be that the highest levels of income should be closer to town, and the lower level of income should be further away. Mm. Exactly the opposite, which led me to look again at the validity of the um, growth center theory uh, and to take some of the things the economists were telling me with a pinch of salt. Yeah, I'm sure. Unfortunately, the facts didn't meet the theory. <laughs> um, much of your work uh, through your career, whether uh, um, in the cartographic uh, domain or in uh, development, has spoken to uh, the power of uh, local knowledge, context-specific mm -hmm. understandings, <coughs> and has tried to cope with the, uh, I won't say vagaries, but the, the extremely disparate nature of tacit knowledge uh, um, in many of these contexts. Mm. Um, yet, we know that the nation state, the international apparatus, uh, uh, tends to uh, work uh, in a very different way, uh, much more of a top-down uh, way. We also have some understanding of the difficulties of scaling up and scaling out, if you permit, um, this local uh, knowledge and local innovation. I wonder what insights you, your career has for us uh, in terms of how we can actually scale out uh, or combine, perhaps, yeah. bottom-up and top-down yeah. approaches. Uh, one comment to start with is um, throughout my career, 
I have uh, an inherent respect for the wisdom and knowledge of local people. They may not always be able to explain that knowledge, but it doesn't mean it, make it any less valuable. I remember reading about one of the um, explorers in East Africa moving through the Rift Valley of Kenya, and the locals told him, don't go and camp by that lake this would because those, speak, I think. those trees are fever trees. Mm. Uh, being um, English and um, somewhat obstinate, no one would believe this um, superstition, as they called it. So they went and camped under the fever trees, and within three weeks, all of them caught malaria. Mm. The locals had, had observed the relationship between disease and the trees, but were using a different explanation. But the, the value of that information was still important. Uh, in terms of development from within, which are now used as opposed to development from below, scaling up is a major issue. I'm more convinced that we can scale out than up. But the real challenge is how do you get from development from above and where does the development from below meet? Mm. At what levels and how do you institute policies and programs which will merge both of these. It's not one as opposed to the other. It's what mix of things do you need to bring about. And there are very few examples of this happening mm. successfully that I know about. I'm now more convinced that spreading out by taking experiences in, in different areas and different countries and looking at how these might be distributed um, both nationally and internationally may make a major contribution to the problems of poverty alleviation and development. Uh, I'm not so certain about the models, the government models, of merging above and below. Fair enough. Let's turn to um, presumably part of your uh, vision for how uh, scaling out would work would require more open systems. Uh, yep. so that we have uh, a much greater <laughs> contribution uh, of uh, individuals uh, and multiple perspectives. Um, what do you see as the major challenges uh, to these open approaches? The major challenges, I think, are getting people to trust government. Um, very often, uh, when information is shared with government, the local people have found out it usually leads to the following increased taxation, loss of land, um, <coughs> misuse of information, uh, all kinds of things which <coughs> local people have discovered by experience are not always in their best interests. So building that level of trust, for example, land information systems. I chaired a workshop last week on land information systems in Latin America, and one of the uh, bodies who were participating was um, someone from the World Bank. And he came to me afterwards and said, you know, I've seen five or six major land information systems developed highly successfully from a technical level. But out of these, only one has actually been of benefit to the locals. The other four or five were used by government to steal the land from the local people. So I think that the issue of trust is, in, uh, is a very important one. If local people do not trust government, they will not share the information because they discovered that by sharing the information it's not in their best interests. I remember the first study I did of um, <coughs> bus fares in rural Kenya. At that time, as I was uh, in education, I had a workforce of um, 150 school kids we would stop all the buses, get on, find out what, the, what they were carrying and what the bus fares were. When I tabulated up the results we got, I found out that the local people were spending 110% of their gross national income, uh, their, their annual income on bus fares, which told me two things. Either the data on the bus fares was wrong, or the locals were seriously underestimating the amount that they told the government they owned. I think the latter was clearly closer to the truth. So this issue of trust, 
For example, in Kikuyu country, if you ask people to count things, they will always give you one less than they actually have. For example, if they have 10 kids, they will always say, I have nine kids. Nine kids and the fill. Because if you reveal to God that you have too much, one will be taken away. Now, if you build that into your statistical analysis, then it will help. If you don't, your results will be totally skewed. This is uh, what we call in the economics uh, the rounding up phenomenon. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, so is it not also the case that part of the mistrust is because, in fact, the government won't release its own data? In some instances, yes. And most of the government data in many developing nations, as you know better than I do, is simply made up as opposed to real. Um, <clears throat> when I look at some of the... Um, what I call the fiction in national development plans, uh, it can be frightening. And even if you look at sources, I can get you a 100% discrepancy between a UN source on something and a national source on something. The quality of information is hugely important. Also, it is not in government's best interests to reveal or to share information, particularly on land, which is a social, political, and cultural issue. What's the most valuable information in Canada today that is not in the public domain? You mean government information? Yes, but public information, let's say. I think that would depend on the context in which you're working and the country in which you're working. Your student, Stephen Walker, mm -hmm. tells me that the answer is takeoffs and landings. Uh, that is one area, but there are others in Canada. For example, um, I don't believe we're making full use of our remote sensing data. Okay. We have hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars worth of data, which is sitting there unused, partially due to the licensing and pricing policies, but also used to the fact that people don't know how to use it. It's, it's a classic example of a supply-driven approach as opposed to a demand-driven approach. But so, yes, takeoff and landings is important. Yeah. And presumably, uh, things like uh, post office codes uh, would be another uh, example. It could be helpful, except that post office codes, again, are a human problem. Um, the post office codes are originally, uh, initially based on the routes the postman took to deliver the mail. Uh, so depending on what the union agreement is on which route you take and how long it is, your postal codes reflect that. Uh, I can remember um, one of my friends who flew from Nigerian Airways. Uh, he was told that um, the local person on the little strip was told if he could see that tree, then uh, it was all right to land. And he had to measure the distance between where he was and the tree. But he's also been told not to cross the runway. And not to get on that plane either. Not, but anyway, right. so he, took, he went up one side, round, and back, and said it's X miles. And in fact, what happened was the plane crashed because it was really a few hundred meters. <coughs> so I think a lot depends on how you define the problem <laughs> and how you deal with the problem. Uh, uh, not too much more for me because I, I do want to uh, allow our uh, audience to ask um, much sharper questions of uh, Professor Taylor than, than I'm asking. Um, I, I do want to uh, come back to the, this uh, question that you yourself raised uh, about the future and, and what you see as um, uh, the future of uh, a censored, multi-censored uh, world. <coughs> what, what, what should we be looking to in terms of real opportunities and what should we feel challenged by and need to? start thinking about uh, addressing sooner yeah. than later? Well, we've moved from a situation where there wasn't enough data to deal with many issues to a situation where there's now too much data, mm. which has to be organized and um, more effectively used. <coughs> I think that what is happening is all of us are becoming sensors, either willingly or unwillingly. Uh, <coughs> the GPS-enabled watch the GPS-enabled cell phone provides all kinds of information which you may or may not know you're getting. And of course, we're now moving to sensors in your clothes. Mm. 
and we're going to be flooded by huge amounts of information. And the challenge will be how do we effectively use that information <coughs> while protecting issues like privacy and confidentiality, which are of concern to some people, <coughs> although the attitudes towards those are changing. Mm. So I think so-called big data is a major challenge. Indeed. Uh, we've done some work on big data, and uh, we're discovering some surprising things. One, it's really not easy to do so far. Um, and I wonder if you think that's going to change rapidly. <coughs> no, I don't think it's going to change rapidly. I think also that instead of collecting data on everything, we're going to have to be more specific in terms of looking at specific demand areas and collecting information, only enough information necessary to apply to that situation, as opposed to total supply of huge amounts of information which you then spend billions of dollars trying to process. <coughs> well, thank you very much, Dr. Taylor. I'm going to open the floor up now uh, to questions. So please come to the mic. Um, there are two mics here and here. And uh, we'll take uh, uh, questions. Um, we also have uh, uh, questions uh, online. Um, and while we're waiting for uh, the first questions from the floor, I'll take one uh, from online. Um, I'll just read it out if that's all right. Absolutely. Legal and technical limitations are detrimental in accessing data for research purposes. For example, indigenous lands locations in Latin America, <coughs> from my experience working with GIS. Due to institutional limitations, it's hard to know if and where uh, an indigenous territory overlaps with a new development or environmental footprint of a business. As a result, it's not only affects and limits geospatial analysis, but also data acquisition necessary to feed the research and subsequently policy, and we end up with poor results. I was wondering, what do developed countries, especially Canada, do to help developing countries to map and record what's important for local development? Well, my first response to that is to ask IDRC what it is doing uh, to address this particular question. And maybe, Dr. McGurk, you could answer. Uh, that's a cheap trick, <coughs> I want to say. Uh, we've, we've done uh, uh, some work in this area, and I, I have colleagues who will, of course, speak to this much more uh, than I. And they happen to be here, and so I'll be turning to them. I'll save you um, to say that um, one example, um, in uh, a country where land alienation by the state and by particular officials in the state uh, of indigenous people's lands was ubiquitous, Cambodia, uh, every major road uh, out of every urban area in Cambodia is uh, flanked by strip uh, development. Um, and one can see it uh, all the way up and down the, the country. And, um, uh, Part of the problems was collective action in Cambodia because uh, of the, of the uh, uh, revolutionary terrors, people had been moved all over the country and people <coughs> were residing in areas that uh, they were effectively new to. And there was a sense that there had been lost this sense of what indigenous lands really were. Uh, and where they were because, in fact, there were all kinds of people of different indigenous areas living in new areas. So what to do about this? Um, a land use movement uh, began where communities themselves began participatory mapping exercises to understand all the different land uses, including um, uh, spirit uses of the land. So things implicit in knowledge and identity also being mapped into these community-based uh, 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 land use uh, exercises. That led to a clear conflict with the land that was owned by King Sihanouk's family in one particular case. And as a result, it was possible to use this social movement to actually appeal directly to the king to address concessions that actually had an impact on spirit lands as well as being right next door to lands of King Sihanouk. And in a specific case, a concession was then denied. Uh, that's the kind of example, I think, 
um, <laughs> that you point to in your own work, so I hope I'm not uh, doing disservice to your own ideas. Um, did you want to say more? Yeah, I think that uh, well, what can we do to help developing countries to map and record what's important? First, recognize the importance of location. Secondly, look at some of the new methods of data collection, such as unmanned aerial vehicles and uh, uh, a variety of others that are, that are ongoing. Thirdly, <coughs> transfer the technology, such as cyber cartography and others, into the hands of locals so they can do it themselves as much as possible. But above all, I think the real issue is a political one, yeah. and that's always very difficult to deal with. Maybe we should try and do no, no more harm than what has been done already. A question from the floor, please, madam. Please tell us who you are. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Helen Johansson. Um, I am retired from Statistics Canada and spent a long time in the federal government analyzing healthcare data. And a lot of what you've said um, has direct relevance because I did uh, data linkage. One of the tools that we were just starting to use was the long form census, which, <laughs> yes, I'm getting some giggles from the audience. Uh, which actually um, does give you a lot of information uh, and which is connected to postal code, of course, and census area. So a lot of this information is, is spatial. Um, and a lot of it uh, is exceedingly useful to correct for bias on all of StatsCan surveys. So I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on... Um, say, the canceling of the long-form census and replacing that with a uh, household survey. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, I'm not a civil servant, so I can speak my mind. And I'm no longer a civil servant. I'm uh, retired, uh, okay. so uh, I have that comfort as yeah. well. <laughs> I think the canceling of the long-form census in research terms was an absolute disaster and has done Canada a huge disservice uh, that means that Mr. Harper will probably cut off whatever funding I've got immediately. <laughs> but that's just too bad. Uh, we'll be sure not to tell him. <laughs> <laughs> Prabir, tell uh, us who you are. My name is Dr. Prabir Niyogi. Uh, I'm a visiting fellow at Carleton University, and I also am an ex-civil servant. I worked my 35 years. Uh, my question uh, to uh, Professor Taylor is a two-part one. Do most, if not all, developing nations now have an accepted spatial data infrastructure into which they fit in their national maps of various kinds? And deriving from that is this question of land use. How is that treated, for instance, in a country like India? Because as Stephen will confirm, the serious insurgency that we have in India called the Naxalite Uprising has occurred in what are called Adivasi regions. Adivasi means first uh, inhabitant. It's the exact equivalent of First Nations. And there the issue is their ancestral lands are being expropriated for various uses from which they are not benefiting. Yeah. Uh, the answer to your first question is yes. Almost every country now has plans to develop or has begun to develop a spatial data infrastructure, and India is no exception. Um, I've been involved in the creation of that thing for a number of years. The politics involved are pretty fierce, but I did have the opportunity to speak directly to um, uh, the new prime minister when he was not prime minister. And in fact, I have on my list of things to do to send him a message just on this topic um, as soon as I can find his email address, which I don't have at the moment. Uh, there are going to be conflicts in terms of um, land in particular. And conflict resolution is improved if you have information, if the local people have access to the same kind of technology as the so-called experts are using. 
then this tends to improve the position in terms of arguing the case. And one of the things we're trying to do is put technology directly in the hands of the local people so that they can counterbalance by scientific argument the arguments coming from the so-called experts inside government. Whether this will work or not in terms of a power struggle is hard to tell. But if you empower people with information, it's a step in the right direction. Uh, I think that they are a step in the right direction in that you will be able to gather information that you would otherwise not have. Now, it's not without its problems. All crowdsourcing data has problems. But it's a huge, crowdsourcing is a huge step forward, and we have to come to terms with merging the crowdsourced information with the so-called authoritative official information and arriving at a better information source. For example, at the meeting I mentioned in, uh, in Mexico City, there was a very good example given by the city of Rio, which has many traffic accidents, and it has uh, monitors all over the city. They have formed a partnership with uh, Waze, W-A-Z-E, which is a crowdsourcing um, information system using cell phones on traffic density and traffic accidents, and they're merging the two and arriving at a much better understanding of the traffic situation in, uh, in Rio. It used to be so bad that uh, with the traffic jams, uh, there is rumors that conception took place during waiting for your, waiting for your, uh, to get to your destination. This has now devolved somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have another uh, uh, question online. Uh, in fact, two questions uh, from the same author. What are some applications you've experienced that serve to convince economists of the importance of geospatial data? I'm speaking from a personal interest in microfinance in Central Asia and social network analysis. This is from Jason Wong. He also asks, regarding scaling objectives, aren't applications that are sensitive to local contexts too costly, both in time and money, to duplicate and scale out? Is the best we can do in scaling out to share data via an accessible platform or infrastructure? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Let me deal with the first one first. Um, to convince economists of the importance of geospatial data, uh, in Canada, I'll use that as an example, we have a situation where <clears throat> the federal government is trying to institute um, uh, a policy relating to vehicles uh, by pricing in order to reduce uh, a variety of other things. I had a graduate student at the PhD level who took this data and found out that the way people look at vehicles in the prairies and in BC and in Quebec is quite different. And we can refine the policies by making sure that you take into account the realities at the regional scale. But you have to convince economists of the importance of geospatial data by giving them concrete examples of how this will improve <coughs> whatever policy they have in, uh, have in mind. It will be an uphill struggle, but I'm more than ever convinced that it's an important way to go. I'm not suggesting that macroeconomic policies and modeling are a bad idea. They're not. They can be supplemented and complemented by a different approach. Now, in terms of um, applications that are sensitive to local context, too costly to duplicate and scale out. Remember that many of those applications are being developed by local people mm -hmm. as a means to survive and to deal with the realities they face. Mm -hmm. The costs are being met already by the people themselves, not by government. Um, if government is not providing as much service as they should, then they've got to do things for themselves. And learning how other people have dealt with things for themselves <coughs> can be valuable and no more costly than other approaches. Uh, indeed, aren't the costs of these sorts of exercises dropping fairly? They're dropping very rapidly indeed. Uh, yeah. <coughs> Please, tell us who you are. Is it on? Ah, there we go. Um, Alexander McGill, I uh, work for the Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development, uh, so I can't speak my mind off of a, a little box. Um, specifically, I work in a unit that used to be part of the development, uh, the former CETA, 
uh, but in the public affairs branch in communications, looking at transparency and one of our tools, uh, the project browser, uh, which gives kind of basic information for the public. Um, it started off as a public communication tool and has since evolved into a, a larger transparency, both uh, in support of the mandate, but uh, also more recently in open government as we're, we're pushing that. Um, one issue that, that I have professionally is how do I convince other bureaucrats um, and then maybe even politicians that this support of the mandate, which has been clear for longer than I've been alive, is worth investing in. Um, I, I have literature. We have examples. We do studies. But we tend to suffer from the where, does the where should this thing go, whose mandate should it be. I'm in a very odd uh, situation in, in a communications branch where the deliverables that I have are, are mandate support. Um, although I'm comfortable in that because I, I like a challenge. But uh, if, you, if you have any advice or, or any insight into how other countries such as the, the Koreans or the Brits were um, more successful in making the link between useful and do it. It's not, it's not an easy question. And you have to be imaginative in your approach. Um, I find that if I'm briefing um, a cabinet minister, as I sometimes do in a variety of countries. Uh, what I use is uh, one of our graphics, usually directed to his or her particular writing, uh, which sends a powerful message because it hits home directly in terms of their own experience. I'm simply saying, if you do this, here, is, here are some of the results that you get. And I found that the, the graphic visual multimedia presentation in one slide or less can be very powerful in persuading people. But you have to show them in concrete fashion. Don't waste your time giving them the context and uh, the, the reasons. Hit them hard, directly, and where it is of greatest relevance. In the Canadian government system, you probably know better than I do, the best approaches come when you insert an idea at the bottom, which works itself up, and at the same time, insert an idea at the top, which works its way down. And if they happen to coincide, you're more likely to get action than if you try to do it in another direction. This is just my experience. I've also found that in, uh, in other countries, and maybe also in Canada too, the fact that someone from the outside is saying something often gets more attention than it probably deserves. Um, but it can be helpful too. So what I will often do is, um, in uh, countries like Mexico and elsewhere, is talk to my professional colleagues and say, what, you know, what is it you need? And then when I talk to the senior officials, I say, this is some of the things you should think about. So it's a, it's a strategy which varies according to where you are. But it's very difficult from inside a bureaucracy to make change because um, sometimes people don't listen. Yeah. I was recently in New York with um, representatives of the government of Canada at the Open Government Partnership. And in discussions with the Canadian delegation, it was clear that um, only one part of a very broad argument was actually, um, in a sense, the accepted uh, argument. And that was an argument about how um, open data uh, creates new business opportunities. Um, the broader moral ideas around transparency and accountability weren't being used, and I couldn't figure out why. Uh, it strikes me that this is a very powerful argument, um, that there's a, a public trust that, that governments hold uh, on behalf of taxpayers uh, that demands uh, an accountability of governments is one of the strongest arguments on behalf of, uh, uh, of open data, particularly open data for governments. Um, there are other reasons as well. Um, the World Bank, uh, when it um, did its first pilot work on um, uh, mapping uh, geographic and remote uh, data uh, in three states in India, um, uh, could not afford to do that work for the whole country. 
so they spoke to the government of India of the day and said, all you need to do is pass a law making it statutorily required for an environmental impact assessment that they have to use this data. And then basically, you've made a money-making machine for the government of India. And it's then worth your while to actually fund this work yourself because you generate revenues until the end of time uh, out of this exercise. So that's another way uh, to think about this exercise. That, in fact, happened, uh, Prabir, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, if there are not more pressing questions, I hope you will join me in thanking uh, Professor Taylor uh, for his uh, uh, patience with me and uh, uh, for his uh, erudite uh, remarks. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>